hello everyone. Uh, I, Jotsna, on the behalf of Team Manav, welcome you all to today's webinar organized by Manav, the Human Atlas Initiative. We are privileged to have with us Dr. Mohit Kumar Jolly from IASC Bangalore to speak about the shape shifters in cancer and how tumor cells switch among different cell states to drive metastasis and drug resistance. His talk will describe how mechanism-based mathematical models for phenotypic plasticity can enable improved understanding of cellular decision-making at individual and population levels. He will explicate this from various perspectives, including multistability, reversibility, irreversibility, hysteresis, cell-cell communication, etc. About Dr. Jolly, Dr. Jolly leads the Cancer System Biology Group at Center for Biosystem Science and Engineering at ISC Bangalore. His group focuses on decoding mechanisms and implications of non-genetic heterogeneity in cancer, uh, cancer metastasis, and therapy resistance. He, they specifically focus on mechanism-based and data-based mathematical modeling in collaboration with experimental cancer biologists and clinicians. Dr. Jolly serves as a secretary for, of the International Epithelial Mesenchymal Transition Association and as the co-chair of Mathematical Oncology Subgroup at the Society for Mathematical Biology. Uh, his work has featured on the cover of Journal of Clinical Medicine, Cancer Research, and Molecular and Cellular Biology. He has also won 2016 iBiology Young Scientist Seminar Series. His work highlights on how an iterative crosstalk between mathematical modeling and experiments can generate novel insights and uncover previously unknown accelerators of metastasis and therapy resistance. Now, before I pass the mic over to Dr. Jolly, a quick announcement regarding the questions you may have. You can see a Q&A tab in the bottom of your player. Please use only that to post your questions which Dr. Jolly will address at the end of his talk. Over to you, Dr. Jolly. Thank you very much, Dr. Josna, for that kind introduction. And I would like to begin with thanking the entire Manav team for this uh, exciting opportunity to share some of our work. I have been following uh, different webinars of this series, and I'm, I must say I'm privileged and humbled to be here. And today I'll be sharing uh, some of the work that we have been doing in the lab. And more importantly, I would like to emphasize upon this iterative journey of how one can develop mathematical models and then look at experimental data, suggest new experiments. And this iterative bi-directional feedback, how one can go back and forth uh, to get a better understanding of how cancer cells move from one organ to another. Uh, I'll just share my screen. And Dr. Josna, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It is. All right. Thank you. So uh, today we'll talk about how cancer cells can switch from one state to another and vice versa during the process when they move from one organ to another. Before we go to the aspect of cancer, let's go back to classical developmental biology uh, because cancer is often seen as uh, an aberration in the process of development, which is how our body is generated from a single cell. So here you have that individual single cell, which over a period of time has the ability to give rise to multiple different cell types. Our body consists of approximately 200 different cell types and how this individual cell gives rise to this in a highly coordinated manner, both in space and time, is the central crux of, of studying developmental biology. And you have various different states in between, which are specific to certain organs, which are called as progenitor cells. Now, this process has been often viewed in this uh, landscape, which was proposed by uh, Waddington in 1940s. What this says is that imagine a ball which is present on this undulating landscape as a cell. And as time progresses, what this ball does is that it rolls down and eventually it settles down in one of these values. And these values are the final cell types which we have in our body. And these 
valleys are so called final states so you know once a cell has become a liver cell for instance it won't overnight suddenly become a heart cell it will stay a liver cell throughout its lifetime so it's relatively irreversible and a unidirectional process and that's how we have been thinking about this now um, you know does this remind you of something else before again we delve into cancer biology so we are talking about how decisions are made how one cell decides whether to go route one or route two when multiple options are available and this is what we also do in our education curriculum for instance right our ones uh, most students uh, are beyond class 10 they are asked to choose okay you, you either become an engineer or become a doctor and then you know similarly these uh, decisions keep on getting more and more specialized and you end up in one or the other careers and of course suddenly a lawyer cannot become a doctor or vice versa right and god help if you were born in up or bihar or other parts of north india then you are destined to appear for upsc because that's the goal of life and un until you appear for that you you will not be resolved and you will be reborn in those parts of india so that you can eventually appear for it anyway jokes aside so um, that's what we have been thinking about how cell fate decisions are made it's a relatively irreversible and unidirectional process uh, but over the years um, what we have now come to understand is that it's not as irreversible there are possibilities in which one cell type can convert to another cell type or one cell type can actually go back and become one of the relatively less differentiated uh, cell types and it can go back all the way here which is what was uh, shown by these uh, fantastic uh, biologists over a period of time for which they got the nobel prize in 2012 that cells can be reprogrammed so now the concept of cell fate which is irreversible unidirectional is slowly giving way to the concept of uh, cell state which you know as you can think of the water has multiple different states and then you can increase the temperature or, or make other changes so that you can uh, you know move it from liquid to solid or vice versa so similarly under different stress conditions it is possible that one cell type becomes another now of course you you still want the robustness in the system to be present. You still don't want a lung cell to randomly become a heart cell when you get up the next morning. But at the same time, you do want a lung cell to respond to injury in case there is one in the tissue and then being able to uh, give rise to other cell types as and when required. So cells do need to show some sort of a controlled enthusiasm where there is some reversibility possible, but that reversibility is usually activated under high conditions of stress. Now, what does this have to do with cancer? So cancer is basically an uh, uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells where cells somehow overcome the limitation that is placed on the normal cells in the body that they can divide only a few times. Now, once that break is gone, what happens is that these cells can divide in an uncontrollable manner, therefore eventually disrupting the physiology, structure and function of a given organ. Now, how do people usually think about cancer initiation and progression is through the idea of mutations. Mutations are changes in DNA sequences that are passed on from generation to generation because DNA is the material that is inherited. So this passing down to generations is irreversible in nature, similar to the idea of a cell fate. And the question then uh, we'll think about briefly is that are mutations really necessary and beneficial at different stages of cancer? Now think about the process of metastasis, which remains the major cause of, um, nine, uh, of all cancer related deaths. 90% of all cancer patients die because cancer is able to spread to different organs in the body. And how does it spread? It largely spreads through this fantastic uh, freeway that we have in our body, which goes all over the way, that is blood vessels. So cancer cells in one particular organ can enter the circulatory system and then travel throughout the body, take exits at different organs and form tumors there. Now, over past uh, few decades, uh, there has been no unique mutations that have been identified for metastasis. There are mutations identified for how cancer cells can overcome the limitation to start growing. There are mutations identified for other processes that are involved in cancer. But when it comes to the most devastating process about cancer metastasis, there is no unique mutational signature that is yet identified. And why is that? We'll come to that in a minute. And metastasis also, please bear in mind, is a highly inefficient process. So over um, you know, 
say 10,000 cells which leave the primary tumor, only two of them are able to form metastasis, but those metastases are sufficiently dangerous enough to take the life of a cancer patient. Then the question comes in, is metastasis driven by mutations or do you really need mutations in the process of metastasis? So think of the process of metastasis from the point of view of someone leaving one's home, traveling all the way where there are various different roadblocks in between and then settling in a completely different environment and eventually being able to colonize that also. Now in that journey, when these cancer cells are going, they are facing their environment around them is constantly changing. So in order to be able to live, to be able to survive, they need to adapt fast and in a reversible manner along multiple of these axes, be it the ability to migrate, invade, be it the ability to evade the immune attacks that are being made, the ability to uh, bond to their neighbors and so on. And mutations are not necessarily the best strategy there because mutations are gained over the time scale of cell division which is approximately 24 hours and cells don't uh, you know stay in the bloodstream for years so to, so that they can get the right mutation which can be helpful and also gaining a mutation is not really a reversible process so once you have made a change then that will percolate throughout generations so the idea that is emerging now in the field is that instead of mutations what is really the driver of metastasis is their ability to reversibly switch to a different behavior which is the idea of a cell state. It's a dynamic variable. Water can be liquid or gas, depending on other environmental conditions. Similarly, these cells can respond to stress and switch their behavior uh, temporarily and come back to it later when the stress is gone. And this idea of plasticity, the ability to switch adaptability has been reported along multiple different axes which are often needed uh, during uh, metastasis. So the kinds of questions that we are looking into is that if cancer cells have to switch to another state, we should first of all know how many states there are. We know water has three states. Do we know how many states cancer cells can exist in? Do we know how they switch? We know if you increase the water temperature to 100 degrees, you boil. So again, do we know those perturbations? Can you predict accurately when exactly is a cancer cell going to switch versus when it is not going to switch? And also, you need this switching on multiple axes. You need to evade the immune system. You need to evade the drugs. You need to migrate and so on. So how are cancer cells able to coordinate all these different things that are just thrown onto them as challenges during that entire metastatic cascade? So one paradigm which has been there in the field, we call the idea of EMT or epithelial mesenchymal transition is the following. That, so if you think of the most common cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, etc., those are cells which do not usually migrate. They actually stay put in a specific 3D geometry and form very tight bonds with their neighbors. Now, once they have to leave the home and the primary tumor, they uh, gain the ability to migrate and lose the ability to adhere. And this is typically the property of mesenchymal cells in the body. So this is your EMT transition, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, during which, um, because of which they can often leave the primary tumor. Now, once they reach the secondary site, they no longer need to migrate. They no longer need to invade. They are actually reaching on their destination and they need to settle down and form on yet another tumor there, which is the exact opposite transition or MET. Now, what people have been thinking over um, in the previous decade is that this, which is shown in cartoons here, uh, taken from various different review articles written by experts in the field, is that this process of EMT and then MET is what drives metastasis. Now, if you look carefully at these cartoons, there are various different assumptions that have been made. The first assumption, as you can clearly see, is that cancer cells have been postulated to have only two states either epithelial state or a mesenchymal state, that those are the only two final states that people usually thought about. The other assumption which is um, hidden here in these diagrams is that EMT is a reversible process. Every cell that undergoes EMT, is it necessary that it can come back? And if it comes back, then does it come back to where it started from or has that transition changed its properties, going through that cycle changes properties in such a manner that it is no longer fit for the process of metastasis. So those are the simple questions we actually got started with once we realized these inherent assumptions that were there. And the approach we took is by writing down mathematical models of which I'll give you a glimpse in a minute. And based on what data exists in the literature, 
then you know solving that set of differential equations that represent those interactions between different molecules going back to uh, the experimental data and seeing whether whatever we are predicting makes sense or do we need to change the model do we need to do new experiments and so on so coming to the first question is emt and met a binary process now when we started looking into this data most of the kind of data that was available in the field was following that they would take epithelial cells in uh, in vitro in in a dish and then treat these cells with an emt inducing agent usually tgf beta acts as one of those good ones and then they'll forget about it for a week or 10 days or 12 days and 12 days later they'll come and image the cells again and see well look see the cell shape has changed it is no longer a typical epithelial shape cell cell adhesion is broken these cells are able to move these cells are able to invade day 0 and final there is no data point in between you don't know anything about the dynamics of this process and as you very well know you know you, you if you look at the pandemic data for instance if you have only two time points and you say well look the number of cases in india at this time point and at this time point is the same that does not tell you anything what was going on in between right so having just two time points without uh, just two end points without any data in between does not really give us the complete picture and that is why you need other tools and the tool we took is that of mathematical modeling now how can a mathematical model help when there is no experimental data in between now you know many of you i'm sure look at these weather predictions uh, and please bear in mind that these weather predictions are predictions just predictions of a mathematical model right but over past um, century we have progressed so much that we can actually uh, relatively accurately predict uh, when the weather of a particular place is going to be of what kind and we trust these predictions so much in our daily lives that we actually make our travel plans based on these right so can we similarly make predictions about the state of a cancer cell can we make predictions about the state of metastasis is is the question that we are trying to ask here and what mathematical models can do is that if you have multiple different uh, players that are interacting with one another over different length scales over different time scales there various different feedback loops etc what mathematical models offer is a platform to put all those interactions together and then see what emerges out of it and then of course see how can you control that dynamics in various ways so you know think of a scenario where you have all the different parts of a car but you don't know how to put them together unless you put them together in a specific manner you do not get the ability to move so what we see here is that whole is greater than some of its parts and that is what is called as an emergent phenomena where uh, once you integrate things together then you get a function out of it or you get something more than the parts out of it so that is what we'll talk about today can we take these exciting piece of data from the existing experimental data develop a mathematical model make new hypothesis and interact in this bidirectional manner and eventually get new understandings about the biological system metastasis or emt in this particular case so when we started looking at emt what you see here is are four different molecules which are interacting with one another the numbers here represent some sort of um, input output relationship gained uh, from experimental data the arrows and uh, hammer heads represent the different kinds of interactions now what you see is uh, what we know from experimental data is that if levels of these two molecules these are both transcription factors if the levels of these two molecules are high then the cell is mesenchymal if the levels of these two molecules are high the cell is epithelial this is very well uh, set up and what you see between them is some kind of a inhibition so the epithelial players do not want the mesenchymal levels to go up and the mesenchymal ones don't want the epithelial to go up it's like two people who hate each other and do not want to coexist peacefully right so the cell would either end up being in epithelial or it would end up being in a mesenchymal state so we wanted to ask are those the only two possibilities or is there a third possibility as well somewhere in between and such kind of models have been developed for uh, simpler microorganisms such as bacteria yeast etc and wanted to take the challenge this is a few years ago and, and ask whether this can be done in the context of cancer as well this is the only slide with equations please trust me and i'll be done in 30 seconds so what we did here is we were able to convert these different uh, interactions into a set of differential equations now what are these differential equations so these differential equations tell you how the um, 
what is the rate of change of these different molecules in a given cell as a result of all these interactions so how, what different factors does it depend on it depends on uh, production so every molecule is produced at a specific rate in the cell every molecule is degraded at some specific rate so this is a degradation rate and then because of these interactions you have these uh, other terms coming in which tell you how the either the production rate or the degradation rate is affected by these different interactions long story short what did the model predict so here is the x axis is an uh, emt inducing signal the y axis is the measure of emt ness of a given cell solid blue lines tell you the stable states the phenotypes and the dotted red lines tell you the unstable state so we only care about the stable states so you can clearly see that there are three stable states one which is epithelial with the very low levels of zeb because zeb is on the right hand side this is the mesenchymal side um then you have another state which is uh, very high levels of zeb and the third state which has intermediate levels of zeb and this is what we called as a hybrid epithelial mesenchymal state now you have looked at the graph horizontally now let's look at the graph vertically up. so you see a region in this case if you draw a vertical line upwards you would cross only one solid blue line which in this case is epithelial so telling you that if the levels of snail are less than this uh, number shown here then you get one and only one state which is epithelial similarly if the levels of snail are more than this then you get one and only one option which is mesenchymal but in between you can have multiple options so at the same level of the signal which the cell is experiencing it has three different choices it can go to any of those three states it's hard to predict which one it will go to it's a probabilistic process right just as a coin flip every new coin flip you can't predict you can only say there's 50% chance of getting a head but you can't predict whether there would be a head or not so that that's the uh, idea here so what our model predicted first of all emt is not binary you uh, there can be a third state then second of all Uh, if you look at cells with the exact same genetic background you can still have multiple phenotypes multiple states and be, be, if there is uh, enough noise around then you know think of that landscape that we were looking at if if you have, if you place that on a shaking table and then you know the landscape is uh, shaking then what would happen is that balls in one valley would begin to switch to balls in another valley and that that switching of balls from one valley to another valley is basically uh, switching of cell states So all these different predictions we made, and we were able to validate uh, these uh, together with our clinical and experimental collaborators. So here you see um, lung cancer cells which have been stained for an epithelial and a mesenchymal protein uh, over multiple different path passages in in vitro in the lab, and you can see that most cells co-express red and green, the two uh, markers that were used, suggesting that this is a hybrid phenotype. Now if you look at individual cell lines be it breast cancer be it prostate cancer be it lung cancer or colorectal cancer and if you measure the levels of these two proteins that i was talking about using flow cytometry you again see that there is this heterogeneity that exists um these are the cells with the same genetic background but they still have different phenotypes and now if you segregate any of them and then let them grow individually you see that they switch over a period of time so here in this experiment for instance once they segregated these over a period of 2 weeks only 80% of cells epithelial cells maintain their state the remaining actually switch to another state so all these predictions are validated the next question is emt a reversible process so you need emt to be reversible so that metastasis can be actually formed so there were a couple of reports which um, indicated this possibility that if emt is induced for a short period of time and then you withdraw the signal then cells go back to being epithelial but if you do that for a long period of time then cells do not go back so there was some indication of a tipping point behavior but where that was coming from was not really well known so again we did a very simple model we said look let's make this model that the longer a gene has been on a player has been uh, at high levels in a cell the easier it is for it to stay on and you know we said this this could happen because this particular protein this particular transcription factor has the capability to rewire the chromatin such that even when its levels go down it has actually repressed its target or activated its targets and so on right so i mean again think of it as a scenario the longer you um, stay in a particular situation the more difficult it often becomes for you to exit that 
right? Because you you get used to things in some sense. So this is some just a popular analogy, uh, not 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 scientifically accurate, but nonetheless. Um, so what we did uh, was we put in such kind of a feedback in the model that I have been talking about, and so ask the question whether this leads to some loss of reversibility, and indeed it did. Here are the simulations when you have no feedback. So when there is no feedback at a given value, you see that 80% of the cells are epithelial and the remaining 20% are healed. When you put in that feedback, you see that the population has drastically changed. Now there are many less epithelial cells that are there, there in this scenario. Similarly, if you put in the feedback on the other side, then you can also make MET as an irre irreversible process. So both EMT and MET can be irreversible scenario. There's, there's just, um, you can't assume that these are going to be reversible processes. It depends on how long have you actually stimulated them. The next question is, is EMT and MET a symmetric process? Now in this diagram, if you look at how cells go from E to M, then this is the trajectory that they follow. But if you look at the trajectory that they follow while going from M to E, it's a different trajectory. And this might remind some of you uh, of the example of hysteresis that you may have studied in the magnetism in your physics class, that the when you put, uh, a substance in a magnetic field, the amount of the strength of magnetic field at which all of them get magnetized in that specific direction. And then if you withdraw the magnetic field, not all of the substance become unmagnetized. You have to actually put it in a reverse in a reverse direction magnetic field and then bring it back. So this is what we predicted that they are not symmetric processes. And we looked at some recent data uh, where we did observe that the trajectory that the cells were taking when they, when they were going from E to M and when they were coming back from M to E in this uh, induction experiment where cells were first treated and then withdrawn. Similar experiments as I was talking to you about, you see that the path is not the same. There is an asymmetry. And similar uh, experiments have been done by other groups uh, looking at proteomics data as well. This is looking at gene expression data. So whatever we predicted is actually seen. So now what has happened uh, is that people are beginning to think of EMT not as a binary process, but as a process that has multiple states in between and mathematical models have played a key role in uh, this paradigm shift. So fine, hybrid states exist, so what? What is their functional relevance? So this is another prediction that we had made uh, a few years ago that hybrid cells are actually the fittest uh, from the point of view of metastasis. They can form the maximum metastasis. Um, this was just a prediction at that point, but recently papers have shown across different cancers that this is indeed true. Uh, this paper shows that in the context of breast cancer, there was another recent uh, paper in Nature and uh, looking at uh, squamous skin cancers where they identified that yes, cells can exist in multiple different states of EMT, not just E or N M, and the ones which are most devastating, most aggressive, most metastatic are not the ones which are completely epithelial or mesenchymal, but the ones which are somewhere in between, which is exactly what we predicted. Um, these hybrid cells can also be drug resistant. This is uh, work led by uh, students uh, in the lab, Sartha, Kashitosh, Harsimran, and Kishore. They wanted to ask this question that when cells switch from E to M, are they also gaining the ability to resist different drugs that are being given to them? Here, they looked at the example of tamoxifen, which is a breast cancer drug, given to a uh, majority of breast cancer patients. And you know, similarly, we lo looked at the dynamics of this uh, network and what we found is that it is possible for cells to switch back and forth between an epithelial state, which is sensitive to the drug, to a hybrid state, which can be resistant to the drug. So when cells are changing their EMT, they're not changing just their EM status. They're not just changing, they, they are not leaving the primary tumor just with the ability to migrate, they're also getting prepared that there may be drugs which will be given and we need to be able to be ready to, uh, to avoid that. The next question we asked is, um, can these hybrid cells also evade the attacks which are being made by immune system? Again, this a project led by Sarthak and Sonali, both the undergraduates at ISC and University of Hyderabad respectively. Um, so what they looked into this uh, dynamics of this uh, signaling network, yet another set of differential equations. And what they predicted was that if you look at how the levels of this particular molecule, PDL1, which is a strong immunosuppressor, how this changes as a function of EMT, you see that the major change that comes in here is not when the cells go from hybrid to mesenchymal, but when they go from epithelial to hybrid. 
and that is what is shown here in this uh, conditional probability kind of analysis. When we look at how many cells are PDL1 positive, how many cells are immunosuppressive, there is much less likelihood of them being epithelial than being hybrid uh, organism kind. Again, we looked at some experimental data. We see the same trends. When you induce EMT, PDL1 goes high. When you withdraw EMT, they take a different path, and uh, you can clearly see that the PDL1 levels are uh, much more down. So what they said is that cells actually need not undergo a complete EMT to be uh, to gain the ability to evade the immune system, and these properties are also reversible in nature. So summarizing this part, uh, as I said. Uh, mathematical models have played a key role in moving uh, this um, thinking about the dynamics of metastasis from just a binary process of EMT and MEG to a process which has many, many more states. And those additional states are actually the ones which are most metastatic. So these are the questions we ask. Is this a binary process? The answer is no. Um, is this a reversible process? The answer is again, not really. It can be reversible as well because of epigenetic feedback. And is this a symmetric process? The answer is again, not really. And there is this idea of hysteresis. Now, switching to drug resistance, that was all about metastasis. Now, what happens in the case of drug resistance? So here is another um, example. Now, this is melanoma. This uh, is not does not follow the EMT, MET paradigm. It's not really an epithelial cancer. Uh, it's a cancer of melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells in the skin. Highly, highly aggressive disease with uh, a low five year survival rate of 22.5%. There are drugs uh, against a particular mutation which is known to be involved in metastasis, uh, sorry, in, in melanoma um, in at least 50 to 60 percent of the cases. But patients who receive this drug within an year, they develop resistance to this drug and they come back with tumor relapse and metastasis. What we know or what has been reported into the literature that there are these multiple states which are present uh, in melanoma. Uh, the cells can either proliferate or they can invade and they can switch back and forth also possibly. So the question that Malvika uh, started to ask is, is there a network that underlies this cell state switching in melanoma? Can we identify that network? And does that network give rise to these two states or maybe even more states? Because in the literature, they were talking about at least these four states. So she applied various different statistical algorithms, came up with a network. And when she simulated that network, what we got was that this network was capable of giving rise to four states which have been reported in the literature, two of which can be largely called as proliferative, two of which can be called as invasive, and cells can switch back and forth between these different states. Now, when you are looking at results of net, the gained from this network, something very uh, peculiar uh, struck us. So here in this diagram, in this plot, what you see is that we have done pairwise correlations between any two genes shown here. So we look at these genes, which are nodes in this network, and we look across all different solutions that we have obtained um, from the simulations. And the red shows a positive correlation, the blue shows or purple shows a negative correlation. So what this tells us is that if you look at these set of genes, they are all positively correlated with one another. And so is this set of genes. But if you look at correlation of these set of genes with the correlation with these sets of genes, then you see they are negatively correlated, which was a very uh, neat pattern that we were able to see in this case. Now that was all model. Let's go back to experimental data, pick up a publicly available data set and do the same analysis. And we do see that this pattern is maintained. So we started asking what, what, what's going on here? So how do we get such well-coordinated patterns? So what we did is that let's take all these nodes and in a network, you will have many, many paths that go from node A to node B. Those paths can be of different length. Those paths can have some activation, some inhibition signs, etc. So let's take a sum of all those paths. The longer a path is, the less effective it is. So if you have A activates B directly and A inhibits B indirectly through, say, five different nodes in between, then the second one gets a lower weightage. And then you sum them up and define some effective path going from A to B and going from B to A. And you do this for all pairs because this is correlation. So correlation between X and Y is the same as correlation between Y and X. But that is not really true for a network. The way A affects B can be very, very different from how B affects A. It's not, not necessarily a symmetric process. 
So Malika did that and found this trend. So what this table tells you is again, uh, how one gene affects all other genes in the network. So here we are only looking at the network topology. We have not done any simulations. Just look at the structure of the network itself. What you see here is that there are these six molecules which all activate each other. There are these three molecules which also activate each other. But if you look at how these six affect those three and how those three affect these six, they actually inhibit each other. So it looks like that there's a team of players. There's one set of players which all belong to a proliferative state. Their levels are high in a proliferative state as reported in the literature. If the levels of those molecules are high, it makes sure that the other ones are shut down. And similarly, if the molecules, if the levels of the other team are high, then it makes sure, you know, it's like a seesaw that they are playing in some sense. And team uh, molecules in one team are supporting each other. They're like, okay, well, uh, maybe, maybe I can, uh, you know, go low because of this repression that is coming on me. Why don't you go up? They are, they are actually helping out each other. So this is a, a tug of war kind of scenario going on. So that, that uh, you know, we started asking, are these teams seen in other examples of cell state switching? Is this a design principle? Is this a common phenomena? And then the next question is, well, why do they exist? Why do biological networks form teams? What advantages do they offer in the first place? Now, let me take you back to the EMT circuit. Here also, there were teams, but we didn't think about them in the form of teams a couple of years ago. And of course, these were only two players in each team. So we just, we just thought, you know, that this thought never occurred to us. Similarly, another example, which the viewers and Sartak had looked at um, last year, where they were looking at how during non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, some uh, liver cells are able to switch to a fat cell-like state. Again, you see there are teams. But again, we didn't think of it from that perspective at that point of time. So we then started asking, if you look at other examples, are there teams seen in cancer and in development? So we looked at this um, network uh, together in collaboration with uh, Dr. Deepak Modi at NIRRH Mumbai, where we're looking at what molecules promote a male phenotype when it comes to gonads becoming either testis or ovary what molecules push it to become a testis, what molecules push it to become an ovary. You again see this team's behavior. Another example, prostate cancer and drug resistance, which is being looked at by Rashi and Abhipsa in the lab. You again see a set of players which are promoting a more EMT and drug resistant kind of phenotype, another set of players which are not really doing that. You see again, this, uh, these two rectangles are largely blue. Uh, so there is mutual inhibition. These were you know, some eight to 10 uh, nodes networks. Laksha, uh, they and Kishore looked at a much larger network, 33 nodes in the network and some 357 edges. This is in small cell lung cancer, which is like another extremely aggressive cancer with less than 10% of high gay survival rate. You again see this behavior. So this was so striking to us that, you know, why do teams exist? Why are they seen across different biological scenarios? So we started asking this question. So we, in the uh, small cell lung cancer SLC network, this is the network. Now, what you see here, if you observe uh, carefully, is that there are this set of players which are all activating each other, this set of players which are also activating each other. But if you look at the links here, they are all inhibitory links. So it's like, again, as I was saying, a tug of war kind of scenario. So one very naive thought we had, maybe uh, when there are teams, then if you delete one edge, the network does not get disrupted too much. So the teams offer robustness against perturbation. That was one idea. So it's like, you know, it's like an in silico CRISPR. You delete an edge and see what happens. This is what we did. And out of 357, if you delete 345 edges, there was no change in the behavior of the network. And we were highly surprised. And there were only 12 edges which made any change. So that tells you know, 12 divided by 357 is such a small number. So teams exist because they can offer robustness against this. We said, okay, let's try it one another way. Now we'll not delete an edge. We'll just shuffle the edges, just as you shuffle a deck of cards. So here I have a, a list of, um, you know, for instance, this is the example. Here A activates B and C inhibits D. I'll just swap these. So now A is activating D and C is inhibiting D. So you didn't change the number of nodes. You didn't change the number of um, links. You didn't change the number of incoming links from a node. You didn't change the number of outgoing links from a node. None of that, but you still swapped. So we did this swapping thousand different times. And every time we simulated and saw how many states were observed. 
this is the graph this is where the original network lies has only four states this is where all other networks lie and please note this uh, is on the log scale so there were networks in fact the majority of the networks actually gave rise to 1000 or 10000 states so again one other roles which teams are playing is that it allows a limited number of states when you shuffle the edges you actually get rid of teams and when you get rid of teams this landscape just goes you know all uh, berserk and you don't have very clearly defined cell states so another reason why uh, schemes may exist is this idea of cell states so these are two uh, possible reasons we have thought about of course we don't have all the answers uh, we are still thinking about uh, do teams offer uh, advantages in other networks as well um, can we compare team strength for networks that are seen in development versus those that are seen in cancer and finally can we think of breaking the teams as as a way to restrict metastasis and as we speak these students are working very very hard to um, actually figure out answer to these questions anish and ankush were both uh, undergraduate students at isc from a mathematics background aditi and varun uh, btech students at rp college um, biotech uh, john who is at isaac pune and that kishore who is a phd student at the lab so just my last few slides uh, will conclude i'm sure many of you have heard this um, quote when it comes to mathematical or statistical models that all models are wrong but some are useful um i would request you to you know think about this quote in a broader sense um think about in vitro models think about in vivo models think about ex vivo models all of those are models model organisms right they are all models and why do we use those models because we think they are reasonably accurate replica of human system and whatever we gain out of understanding we gain out of those models can help us move forward in our understanding of the human system that is what mathematical models are also trying to do it's just a different toolkit um, which is relatively new especially when it comes to cancer biology so again you know each model has its own uh, assumptions strengths and limitations and we should think to working uh, closely in integrating those strengths so what can mathematical models do as i talked about uh, they have they can actually reveal these assumptions which are hidden in some black box they can identify patterns in underlying biological networks why do teams exist and they can also ask whether if you take a set of interactions then can that set of interactions give rise to a specific phenomenon so models cannot replace experiments of course but they can ask these questions and help better design uh, various different experiments now these are the kinds of um, networks schematics that you would see in various different um, cancer biology uh, literature for instance this is from one of the most cited papers in the field of cancer biology now one can say that yes there is enough information about which molecule interacts with what another but if you think from a more quantitative perspective there is no information on time scale here there is no information on length scale here there is no information on how linear or non linear the interactions are if this molecule is getting activated by four of them is it an and gate is it an or gate or what exactly is going on is none of that is uh, present here all that are hidden in this black box in this assumptions that we have and what mathematical models help us do is question those assumptions write down those assumptions and then uh, solve for them and the goal is you know um, i'll just give a quick anecdote here so when the anti angiogenesis therapies were being tried out in the clinic the idea behind them was angiogenesis means the growth of blood vessels so anti angiogenesis means therapies which inhibit the growth of blood vessels cancer cells are known to be capable of giving rise to their own blood vessels so the idea was okay let's cut down their blood vessels they will not get, they will not have oxygen they will not have nutrients they'll die when this was tried out the result was completely surprising and you know disappointingly surprising patients receiving the drug were actually dying faster and later we figured out this was happening because when you are blocking them from getting their nutrients you are actually promoting metastasis and various therapies are actually known to promote metastasis at the end of the day so you know again we need to think of cancer as a dynamic adaptive and complex system not just a dumb collection of cells which is sitting there and waiting for us to make a perturbation and you know this is again the last sentence of the most cited papers in the field of cancer biology hallmarks of cancer where the authors um, concluded by saying that cancer biology will hopefully become a logical um, 
uh, will become a science which has a logical coherence that rivals that of chemistry or physics, where you develop mathematical models, test your predictions, and this iterative cycle goes on and on. Um, Ten years later, when they wrote Hallmarks of Cancer, the next generation, they again ended by saying that we still are far away from understanding any organizing principles, how exactly things operate. Uh, so clearly, you know, this call for mathematical models or to look at it in a more predictive sense is not just coming from uh, systems biologists or mathematicians. This is uh, coming from uh, the experts in the field of cancer biology as well. That I would like to thank the fantastic set of people I have had the fortune to collaborate with and interact and without uh, the insights coming from all these different disciplines, it would not at all have been possible uh, to gain uh, at least some answers that we have been able to. And I really enjoy this iterative process. And I'm just a spokesperson. Um, people actually burning the midnight oil are all here. I work very, very hard and try to figure out uh, answers to some of these questions. So I'd like to give a big uh, shout out to all of them. And I would end with where I started from. Right? So please don't think of the choices that you have made so far um, as irreversible. Uh, transitions on. There is possibility that, uh, and as we have seen in the lab, we, we have members coming from so many different backgrounds, engineers, bioinformatics, physics, mathematics, cancer biologists, etc. And they've all gotten together and brought their own fresh perspectives to look into this problem. So if you have chosen to be, you know, follow a, pers uh, a particular career path at some point, that must have been based on whatever you knew at that point of time, but that does not dictate that it's an irreversible transition. You know, we are at the end of the day collection of cells and when cells can switch states, we can of course switch fields and you know, we don't need to go to that extent. You can still collaborate and uh, learn across fields and have an emergent outcome of understanding of the system by working together with uh, such an interdisciplinary group. So th this um, setup is archaic and what is happening today is that people from different disciplines are actually coming together and trying to solve the open questions which are there in the field of not only cancer biology, but various different um, open questions in the field of biomedical engineering. With that, I would thank you so much for your attention and I'll be very happy to uh, take questions and criticisms. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you so much, Dr. Mohit. It was really engrossing. Like I was completely engrossed in the talk and just lost track of time. I was just going through the slides one by one. Um, we have few questions. One of them, you know, it's very, very interesting, a bit naive, I would say, but can the cell surface proteins be modified in some way to prevent metastasis? So I guess they are talking about how, you know, signal transduction works, you know, for this transition, what can be done about that? So it's a very interesting, and I thought probably we should take that up first. Yeah, th thank you for that uh, interesting question. Uh, I don't particularly work in that area, but I do know of reports, including uh, by my colleague, Dr. Amre Bhatt here, who has looked at how different modifications on the cell surface molecules are connected with different aggressiveness of cancer cells. So in a cancer cell population, uh, there were these different um, glycan modifications, uh, if I remember that correctly. And based on uh, that, he did observe a connection with their ability to uh, show invasion. Now, how is that functionally connected and what is the entire cascade is something that I'm not an expert on to comment. But yes, it is possible. Right. So are we seeing that the crosstalk that is happening between... Um you know, the metastatic cascade and the cellular yes. metabolites, basically, and the way they are adapting to this change and this changed microenvironment, basically. Right. Do we need to target that? So that should be the target for these drugs now, these epigenetic regulators, basically. They should be the target for the for drug development. Is that what we are implying, sir? So Yes, yes. So how exactly states are switching um, and can we block their ability to adapt? Can we lock them in a specific phase so that then if you give the drug, then you have identified their vulnerability and are able to tackle it. Great, great. So, sir, I was just wondering that uh, you have shown a lot of in vitro studies that have been done, right? So uh, how are you planning to translate? Uh, when I was going through your CV, you are working with clinicians as well, right? So how are you planning to translate this, if at all, you know, down the line? Yeah. So um, I'll give you an example. That's an excellent question. And I'll give you an example of one in vivo study that one of our collaborators has done. So we, in the work I didn't go into details of today, but we predicted that if you break these feedback loops, which exist, a particular type of feedback loops, 
then you can actually bring down metastasis. And this experiment was done in vivo uh, using CRISPR. They broke down a specific feedback loop and did observe that metastasis went down significantly. So at least in vivo, there is evidence of this. And now we are working with them to figure out, um, you know, which feedback loop to break. I mean, in a cell, it's like an atom bomb, right? You, you get to break only one and you have to decide which one to break. And that is what where I think mathematical models can come in a big way and tell you uh, which ones break or not break to have maximal effect. Yeah, that's that's a great answer, actually. Uh, so there is one more interesting question. So what is the most challenging difficulty to integrate multiple models into a super model that could be able to better explain cancer and other phenotypes? Yes, so uh, that's an excellent question again. Um, what we have been doing is uh, sort of while keeping this bigger questions uh, about EMTs binary or not reversible or not symmetric or not in mind. Um, looking at data coming in from different cancers, different cell lines, different collaborators and see, can we make models you know, specific to that particular setup as well? Instead of making more generic things, can we say what strategy is going to work in this case versus another case, right? And I mean, this pandemic scenario has given us a beautiful example of when to use models and when not to use models or in the sense that how to use models, in, right? You, you, you cannot take the parameters of Pune and apply it to design vaccination strategies in Bangalore or vice versa. So your model needs to be designed at a level of granularity at which the data is accurately available. And a model that explains everything is a model that is completely useless because it explains nothing. Uh, and the test of the model is uh, in sticking its neck out and being able to make a prediction uh, which can be falsified. That's, uh, sorry, I was just talking on mute. So that's really interesting, actually. Uh, basically, uh, we are also into, uh, you know, doing, uh, developing these models. And um, can we see, you know, uh, a mathematician or a pilot working towards integrating domains to create something? You know, it really opens avenues for many of our students, listeners who are here to, and, uh, you know, help them understand that to be something that can be enlarged and, uh, you know, because like future of biology also right yes so that's really great uh, so there is another uh, there are a couple of questions around the uh, the pluripotent stem cells basically like for example how does Waddington's theory of canalization apply when a pluripotent embryonic stem cell has to differentiate into the three germ layers during the embryonic development they are all basic science questions so if you could just answer them for our listeners right so yes, uh, the Waddington's uh, landscape picturization uh, basically is a metaphor to try to understand how these networks can give rise to these different states. Now, the networks which are operating at that time point in development, the, does it really give rise to only three states or are there many more states and se there are other factors that push cells in those states, right? If you look at a very small network, two nodes, two edges, A inhibits B, B inhibits A, the simplest one that you can think of, it already gives rise to two states. And now we are talking about 20,000 genes and I don't know, some millions, if not billions of edges. And that gives rise to only three states is something, there's some, either there's a miscalculation or those networks are so specially designed that they give rise to a discrete number of states. And that's what we are trying to say through the idea of teams, that then the one another role of teams is that it actually helps in canalization and makes sure that there are only well-defined states and cells don't keep on wandering around the landscape forever. They actually settle down uh, after a reasonable amount of time. So biology is definitely fascinating. And I mean, we are, we are yet to reach uh, there and understand what's going on, actually. So uh, another uh, question that probably I would uh, like you to answer is, uh, there are two staining methods to show presence of a hybrid state. So are there these quantitative methods to determine the state uh, the cancer cell might be in? And uh, this particular listener is also asking that, I believe that this may help in precision targeting of drugs that if we develop drugs specific to that particular stage. So do, do you think that's true? That's, that's something can, that can be done? Uh, definitely, yes. So um, the entire community is currently um, 
I mean, many of the, many people in the community are focused to characterize these states much better uh, at a molecular level as well as at a functional level. So some examples have showed that we know that they form more metastasis, uh, at least in breast cancer and squamous cell cancers. Um, but what is the epigenetic mark? What is their vulnerability uh, in various different? Like, what is their metabolic mark uh, profile like? What is the mechanical profile like? All that has been currently worked out. And yes, the goal is indeed towards that because we know that high, uh, hybrid cells are perhaps one of the most aggressive ones. Can we now do apply some targeted therapy and push those cells into either epithelial or mesenchymal where their aggressiveness goes down? Right. So there is another listener who wants to understand your views about mathematical metastasis modeling. So they are asking, is it very difficult to predict the cellular signaling molecules which control EMT to EMT and uh, understand uh, the acquired drug, drug resistance in cancer, in cancer patients, basically? So um, is it difficult to predict, uh, basically, the cellular signaling? Yes, it, it is difficult to predict because... Uh, there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. So uh, when we were, uh, when we submitted this paper about EMT and drug resistance, one of the reviewer comments we got was, well, you know, these are not the only five molecules that influence things. And we were like, yes, we agree. There are 50,000 of them and you will come up with 10,000 more in the next four years. Um, so we are not saying that this is uh, the network. We are saying that this network is capable of giving rise to this. So the, again, the idea of necessity and sufficiency. This network is sufficient to explain what we are seeing. And um, this is a, 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 a mathematical modeling is a platform where you can keep adding more nodes, keep adding more parameters, and then explore the dynamical landscape as well. So think of it and uh, not as a panacea, but just as yet another tool just as there is Western blotting. Think of this just another tool which would help us tell something further. Sure. So uh, one other interesting question. Can you provide some insights in the direction of metabolite networks in cancer metastasis? And is it possible to model metabolite interactions to understand metastasis? Some, some of it is available in literature, isn't it? So Yes, yes, yes. So there is literature on uh, metabolic plasticity and metabolic reprogramming right. in the context of metastasis as well. Uh, and we are looking at connections with EMT. So when cells undergo EMT, do they change their metabolic reprogramming and vice versa? When cells switch from an oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis or vice versa, then do they change their EMT? Is this a bidirectional coupling or not? Those are questions we are still trying to uh, understand. Right. Um, this particular listener, uh, listener is asking a very interesting question. Since many things are still unknown about cancer, will it restrict us to develop mathematical models? Because you know there are so many things out there which we don't understand, and we can account as variables in these models, right? So since we don't know them, how, how do we account for such things? So uh, another beautiful question, and I think I'll go back to saying all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, so, you know, when, when we did, so maybe tomorrow there's a new type of immune cell we know about, and then everyone will be um, rushing towards incorporating that into their co-culture system, into their organoid system, into their humanized mouse model, etc. right? So just as we update our biological models based on the new understanding that we have, we can also update our mathematical models. It's just a different tool set. Uh, there are so many more questions, but I think that uh, we have run out of time, but I would just like to tell our listeners that we would be sending all these questions to Dr. Uh, Mohit, and we hope that he will, you know, uh, provide answers to these questions, and once that's done, we'll send all these answers to all the listeners, because we have run short of time. It's already, uh, you know, uh, well past the time. So I... Thank you so much. Sir. So at the outset, I would just like to thank each one of you, all the listeners, and most importantly, uh, Dr. Mohit uh, for you know sparing time and giving us those beautiful insights on all these processes that we have been reading about. But you know, in depth analysis to this extent is something which always enlightens us. So that's thank you so much, sir. Uh, all the attendees are also requested to submit their feedback through the feedback form, which has been sent. The link has been sent in the chat box. Please uh, make sure that you provide your inputs following which the participation certificate will be sent over to you. And in case you were unable to attend from the beginning, you know, or would like to rewatch this beautiful webinar, a recorded version of this is available on our YouTube, YouTube channel. So uh, thank you again for joining us today and uh, keep watching our uh, 
social media space for uh, other updates. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohit and all the listeners. See you the next time.